Welcome to the CEO's Open Discussions Corner at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are always on the hunt for the best opportunities that exist within the hottest new industries. Our guest today is Mr. Timothy Coe. Timothy is the CEO of Entheon Biomedical. Entheon is a biotech company which is on the cutting edge of the groundbreaking psychedelics industry. Psychedelics are positioning to become huge within the field of mental health, which carries a massive potential for wealth. We want to become well acquainted with this industry, which is projected to begin to explode within this year of 2021. So we are excited to have Tim here to explain the overall details of this sector and to introduce to us his company, which just recently launched onto the stock market. Tim, welcome to the show. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much, Michelle. We are excited to have you here and thrilled to explore this brand new business sector, which means a huge difference and development within the mental health industry. So, Tim, let's start off, please, by explaining to everyone what psychedelics are and what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, First off, thank you for the opportunity to everyone listening. Thanks for listening. Um, Yeah, psychedelics. um, We're in the middle of a renaissance, I think. You know, I know that, um, you know, the word psychedelic is not unknown to people, but I think the context is changing rapidly. Um, Psychedelics, as they were known, you know, 10 years ago, are often associated with the Grateful Dead, fish concerts, and things like that. Um, but I, we're, you know, as a community and sort of scientifically, we're understanding uh, recently that, you know, beyond just creating these you know, trippy experiences, that at the core of that mechanism of that experience is something really therapeutically valuable, or at least potentially therapeutically valuable. Um, you know, that idea of this, um, you know, upon taking a tab of acid or eating mushrooms or doing ayahuasca, um, the individual having these really powerful visions, um, you know, it does do that. But I think in the context of psychotherapy and really operating on uh, the individual and how they perceive not only what they see out in their hallucinations, but how they look at themselves, psychedelics are massively powerful in that regard. Um, They operate on a set of receptors in the brain um, that is responsible for any number of things, uh, you know, principally of interest to us being uh, the receptors that regulate mood. And so, um, you know, for us, what we're trying to explore is um, using some of these psychedelics and these powerful molecules in a very rigorous, clinically, um, sort of clinically rigorous way um, and seeing the effect that that has on an individual that may be suffering from mental illness, such as depression, anxiety, or uh, substance use disorder. This is just fascinating. It's a fascinating science, really. And um, taking a spec back, it's much like the cannabis industry, because psychedelics are going through, as you mentioned, a kind of a renaissance or a revolution of legalization all around the world. We know that they offer enormous mental health benefits, but when it comes to the science of remedies. What are the advantages of psychedelics and what do they bring to the sector of the mental health industry as it stands? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important not to just look at the potential of psychedelics, um, but also looking at the reality of the currently existing options to treat some of these mental illnesses. Um, I think for the past good number of decades, we've seen the, you know, the promise of, you know, antidepressants and things that are related to mental health. Um, And I think, you know, anyone that's been alive long enough knows someone that has had depression um, and has known also someone that struggled with finding the right medication. And too often the case is that, you know, uh, an individual may become depressed and then go on a bit of a carousel of molecules or substances, um, whether it's, you know, Prozac, Effexor, uh, Wellbutrin, um, and just never really arriving at something that fixes them. Um, and yeah, too often, I think, you know, we look at the science from the perspective, is there a chemical imbalance within the brain uh, that a molecule can come fix by, you know, preventing the uptake of serotonin? When in reality, I think there's 
right now we're undergoing a uh, sort of reframing of the discussions about what constitutes a mental health disorder. It's more complex than just the sort of brain chemistry. Um, and it takes into account, you know, things like trauma and sort of societal makeup. Um, and really um, what psychedelics are doing, it's, you know, they operate on those same receptors, but um, it does enable this uh, more holistic approach to assessing one's wellness. And it really does incorporate, um, you know, more than just the pharmacological, but also um, that psychiatric component of um, you know how a person views themselves, and, and we're beginning to see the merger of that world where beyond just the chemical, um, you know how does this affect the person's sort of internal uh, composition in terms of their um, emotional and psychological uh, composition. Right, right. And right now, I think this is such an important topic because mental health is really becoming the focus just because of what's happened over the past year with COVID-19. There's so much depression and that can, if someone's been addicted before to something, you know, Mm -hmm. and they struggled and they beat that something, say two, three, four years ago, this right now is such a sensitive time to be able to fall back into those patterns. And so something that's an alternative that how, how much of nature is this? How natural are psychedelics as comparison to pharmaceutical products? Yeah. um, The psychedelics in general are, you know, derived of plants that have been used for, you know, centuries, if not millennia. Um, You know, LSD was a more recently synthesized thing, but uh, psilocybin plus, ayahuasca have been used societally from uh, different indigenous cultures for centuries. Um, And so what we're working on is DMT. And so DMT is the active psychoactive component of ayahuasca. Um, For some of your listeners, they may know ayahuasca is this really powerful traditional medicine used by South American uh, indigenous populations to treat, um, you know, diseases of despair, sort of deal with existential anxiety and sort of a feeling of loss, um, among other things. Um, so yeah, DMT is, um, it is found in there, but the reality is in bringing this, um, you know, making this a prescribable medicine for people with medical conditions. Uh, the reality is that in the eyes of the regulators, um, you can't enter something that won't be repeatable or precisely dosable. And so the path that we're taking is, taking the best from nature, this molecule that is, uh, you know, different cultures have known to be so powerful for so many centuries and bringing it into a modern scientific context, making sure that it's synthetically derived, you know, chemically the same, like structurally identical to the DMT that's found in nature, but doing so in such a way that to a very precise degree of repeatability and predictability, um, the patient that's undertaking the experience can know with certainty that uh, they're receiving the same dose that um, you know, is described on the label. Right, right. Really interesting, too, the history and the therapeutic you know, qualities of it in terms of probably indigenous people and back thousands and thousands of years. So this is just interesting on a historical level, but I want to give everyone an idea of the size of this sector, Tim, how many people does the mental health industry affect on a global basis? And how much does that translate into in terms of money? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, it's almost to such enormity that it's hard to put a, a finger on precise definition, but specific to what we're focused on, um, it was estimated that there are over 21 million substance use disorder sufferers uh, that are you know, qualify as needing treatment, but sadly only one tenth of those uh, people actually receives any sort of treatment. Um, and so that's a massively underserviced population. And that's just the reported number. Um, the difficulty with the reporting on this is that it's very difficult to estimate. Um, a lot of people suffer in silence and in secret, um, but there is already a massive um, industry around this. It was estimated being worth $15 billion, the sort of traditional drug treatment market. Um, and the, the thing about that is that for the large size of that market the efficacy is actually pretty shockingly low Um, we understand that some of the drug treatment modalities that exist right now um, can cost anywhere from between five and thirty thousand per you know stay at a residential treatment center Um, and when you pair that with the idea that the efficacy can be as low as five or ten percent you know you 
begin to form this picture of you know this being a very high cost paradigm model with a really low level of efficacy and so um you know over the course of a person's lifetime you know the efficacy being so low it's very common to have someone go to multiple drug treatment centers and still have no effect and ultimately meet their you know untimely demise um, as was the case with my family uh, we lost my brother to substance use disorder in March of 2019 and that was over the course of 20 years um, probably in eight or nine different drug treatment centers on every medication sort of medically available to treat a person like my brother uh, antidepressants anxiolytics antipsychotics all all manner of cognitive behavioral therapies and psychotherapies um, and all to no avail ultimately yeah there's a large price tag associated with something that very often does not work well enough and so yeah, there is a massive market opportunity, and that's, um, you know, to, to characterize it as that is that's a reality. But really what we're talking about is there's a massive need. Um, and, you know, we see psychedelics as being that real game-changing opportunity where all of the efforts that traditional psychotherapy and medicine try to get at, which is to get the individual to explore themselves, um, psychedelics really do have the opportunity to potentially be a back door to that insight where a person can access some of the stuff that they're unable to access traditionally um, and really have these profound you know, introspective insights so they can understand where their motivations are, where their barriers are, and really unburden themselves of some of the difficulties that a lot of us really carry with us unbeknownst to our sort of conscious brain. Um, so yeah, psychedelics, um, you know, we see that sort of that, that, uh, I guess, comparative evaluation, about what already exists versus, you know, what the potential is. And that potential isn't just an assumption that we have. Um, it's premised on a pretty strong foundation of uh, literature review as well as, yeah, the preliminary studies that are taking place now. Right. Right. And it's such a fascinating topic. Um, the financial aspect of it, of course, for investors, the potential is just explosive. It's massive. And the time right now to get in the ground floor level of innovation is there. But what you just spoke of, obviously, um, you bring such a huge personal side to this. And I think every person alive um, goes through depression. It's part of being human. You have your ups, you have your downs. And if you don't, you're not living life to the fullest. And that's just the truth. You know, um, so people who um, hide their mental illness until the point where it gets so bad mm -hmm. that, you know, they've lost everything, they've become homeless, they've done things that they typically wouldn't do to know this kind of thing is out there and to take the stigma away from it and add the coolness of the history of this plant is extraordinary. Now you touched on your brother. So I'm of the thought that you went into this direction as CEO of this company from a very personal standpoint. Um, tell us a little bit about your own business background, what you bring to it. And again, your perspective on entering this industry. Sure. Um, yeah, no, uh, previous to this, I've been a man of many hats. Um, prior to this, I was involved in the technology space, working in uh, the, yeah, at the time, very new area of distributed uh, technologies or decentralized technologies. Um, and a really important thing that that taught me is that, um, yeah, just how to be adaptive and learn things very quickly. Um, but outside of that and understanding my own limitations that, you know, what's required to create a successful business beyond just a personal passion or level of interest is filling the room with the sort of smartest people that I have uh, sort of globally available to me. And so a really important thing that I learned from that venture, as well as other ventures in the service space, as well as the investor relations space is that um, me as an individual passion can only do so much. Um, and so very quickly after my brother's death and in the founding of this company, um, I made it my mission to, in that acknowledgement of my limitations, to find uh, sort of rigorously the most intelligent people in the space and actively recruit them. And so um, for the people listening, if you're to look at the advisory board and the team that we've assembled, um, they're some of the most recognizable names in the psychedelic space. 
um, doing some of the most research and from institutions such as Johns Hopkins University, as well as the Imperial College of London. So um, yeah, my previous experience taught me how to get a general and sort of quick understanding of things, but it also taught me that, you know, specialists exist and rather than try to shoulder the burden of doing something myself, um, find the people that are far superior in terms of their intellect to occupy those very necessary roles. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's focus in on your company right now. Talk to us about it. What is it? When was it formed? Um, What is your business model? Just give us the big picture, Tim. Sure. Um, Yeah, so we are obviously in the psychedelic research space um, for the purposes of treating people that suffer from substance use disorder. Um, And the molecule that we've selected, uh, sort of taking through the clinical research pathway is dimethyltryptamine, that's DMT. Um, A really key, I guess, differentiating factor between DMT um, and psilocybin. Psilocybin is catching a lot of buzz and for good reason. It has a ton of potential to massively affect how people think and behave based on that idea of internal transformation. One of the limitations that we see with psilocybin is that the length of the experience, uh, you know, which is an overwhelmingly positive experience, is somewhere from between six to eight hours long, during which time, you know, physician and nurse have to attend. So from a scalability perspective, it's not the most ideal molecule. Uh, from a commercialization, actual sort of like in commercial use perspective, there are some limitations that are posed by that. With DMT, uh, DMT is a massively powerful but short acting molecule that gives us the ability uh, when infused or administered intravenously to shorten that experience to anywhere from between 60 to 120 minutes, allowing for the potential of you know more throughput and more clinical throughput uh, per day. So adding to that commercialization uh, opportunity, but also adding to that component of safety. Whereas during that psilocybin trip, that could be six to eight hours long, you know, negative adverse reactions can and will happen. Um, And do you know, during which time there are no real therapeutic interventions for bringing that person back from the ledge with DMT. If a person does become overly activated or go into a, therapeutically unuseful space, we can titrate, modify, or stop the experience and bring that person back down a functional baseline without danger of traumatizing them by keeping them in this really difficult space for too long. So, um, you know, in order to get this uh, you know, product approved and ready for consumption in a commercial market, we need to adhere to the pretty stringent regulatory pathways that are established for traditional drug discovery in the world of pharma. And so we have a clinical trial plan for um, late 2021. And we also have our GMP, so that's Good Manufacturing Practices Drug Supply, from a partner in uh, Canada. And so those two things will form the basis for our clinical uh, discovery. But that being the core of what we're after, we're also very interested in understanding um, what constitutes a positive or a negative experience for a patient. Um, Really, um, there's an opportunity, I think a need for physicians to be better informed about you know, what goes into making a prescribing decision for a patient. Um, Right now, there are a number of molecules, ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, and potentially DMT in the future that can potentially be uh, prescribed for all number of similar diagnoses like depression, anxiety, or substance disorder. Um, And we, we understand that there are a lot of variances in the individual that will make them respond potentially differently to different molecules and have, you know, potential uh, negative adverse reactions. So we recently acquired a company in the genetic space um, that has a, uh, a commercially available uh, unit quite soon that will give indicators to whether a person has the genetic predispositions to, um, based on biomarkers, genetic predispositions to have negative adverse reactions from a psychedelic event. Um, And we recently partnered with a company in the EEG space so that we could better analyze a person's uh, baseline brain state before they ever take a psychedelic. So, you know, we're taking a big data approach in terms of aggregating all the relevant user data before a person even 
has a psychedelic experience so that we can ensure a higher degree of safety and potentially create tools that could be used not only for our own internal validation and research purposes, but potentially for this entire psychedelic sector in a pretty near term way. Uh, we're very eager to do that research and to create a set of tools that could be used by uh, the likes of ketamine clinics as well as psilocybin, uh, you know, physicians, psilocybin prescribing physicians and therapists um, that will be coming on soon. Wow. Wow. It, it's just such a, a fascinating field. And it's so, um, you know, what we're talking about, obviously, is, is highly clinical. And um, it it's, goes into the very high end of um, medical research. And um, for you to be coming on the stock market and offering investors the opportunity to ride this with you, also with the, you know, the federal legalization and everything just starting off. This is a very baby industry that's going to obviously form the basis for a huge potential change, which is very much needed within um, the uh, medical industry. On the stock market, Timothy, what are your tickers and where do you trade? Yeah, we are trading on the CSC under the ticker ENBI. We're also trading on OTC uh, pinks as ENTBF. Um, as well as the Frankfurt Exchange under uh, 1XU1. Okay, okay, beautiful. Now, you touched on your management team, and mm -hmm. I'd love for you to go into who they are and what kind of business background they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so alongside me is uh, Dr. Andrew Hegley. Uh, he's our chief science officer. He represents the University of British Columbia uh, Pharmacology Department. He's been involved in all manner of uh, early scientific research in the preclinical realm, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, focused on sort of cannabinoids as well as uh, early biotech. Um, so he brings that understanding of the, the, the very necessary scientific mechanisms that are needed for uh, providing that a solid basis of um, empirical data. Um, alongside me there is uh, Ruth Chun. She's a board member. Um, she's a Juris Doctor, um, previously worked in the world of cannabis, has been responsible, responsible for a good number of transactions, um, and she provides a great detail, a uh, great level of detail and guidance. Um, then Brandon Schwab has worked in a variety of other industries. He's our Chief Financial Officer. Um, yeah, and worked in a, you know, a, a a good number of different industries. Um, and then on our um, advisory side, uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, um, some of the most reputable and well-known names in psychedelic sciences. Beautiful. Name a couple of them. Yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, on our advisory side, we have people like Robin Card Harris uh, from Imperial College of London. He is one of the foremost researchers in psychedelic uh, science. Uh, leading all number of studies with regard to DMT as well as psilocybin. Um, and Imperial College of London, I think it needs to be mentioned, is um, one of the uh, leaders in psychedelic research and a lot of the uh, most influential and significant research takes place there. And then on the other side of the pond, we have Matthew Johnson um, from uh, Johns Hopkins University. He runs their Psychedelic Research Center. Um, and he was recently featured on 60 Minutes. Uh, Anderson Cooper interviewed him. Um, and yeah, he is, an, again, uh, one of the leaders in the psychedelic research space. Um, and then, you know, as well as, you know, we don't want to forget uh, people like Dennis McKenna, uh, famed brother of Terence McKenna, one of the oldest uh, psychedelic researchers, um, particularly in the field of ayahuasca, uh, where we got some of our inspiration uh, for the use of DMT, as well as Malamu Todd and Christopher Timmerman from Imperial. It's just such an extraordinary company. And once um, investors look into, you know, who is on your board and who is part of your management and also the explosiveness of this industry. Um, what is the most important thing, Timothy, for people to understand about the mental health industry and the role that psychedelics will play in the future? Great question. Um, there was a quote recently, I don't know who to attribute it to, but um, the quote, the, the gist of it is that psycho, psychedelics will be to psychotherapy what the microscope was to science. Um, I think, you know, we do exist in a time where 
obviously the the straight pharmacological approach to mental health um we've witnessed the experience of uh, the experiment and the sort of the potential the promise and then what the outcome is um and you know i don't think that the psychedelic industry would be so hotly discussed or um, thought of as having this potential if the options that already existed worked and so i would ask anyone that's doing their research to really just you know spend a quiet moment and think about is the current psychiatric medicine model working for the people that suffer and i think if there's a, some honest contemplation they will say no i know any number of people that you know have mental health diagnoses that aren't being serviced by what's currently available um, and with psychedelics, I think we exist in an interesting uh, position where observing how psychedelics have been used for centuries and millennia by other cultures to really work on, you know, these things that we might deem, um, you know, spiritual sicknesses or diseases of despair. Um, you know, we, those cultures may call them that, but I do think within the lexicon of sort of current Western language, often the afflictions that we deal with uh, might be, you know, called those things. So whether it's depression, anxiety, you know, obsession or addiction, um, we can see those as manifestations of this idea of a disease of despair, uh, this sort of existential difficulty that we just carry with us. And so um, understanding that there's a gap in terms of what's already available, and there's this huge potential we're still in the early stages where we need to, in connecting that, in seeing the potential out, we need to approach it from a highly rigorous scientific perspective. And so, um, you know, that's what the work of companies like mine have to do is to validate those assumptions, but do so in such a way that um, you know, the assumptions that we have are tracked and structured in such a way where the science is eventually going to be presented to the regulators so that they can assess it objectively and say, yes, you know, this is both safe and effective for what you're talking about. And so that's the very um, serious work that we're doing as a company. Yeah. The basis of this coming into the, um, the legalization of it on a federal basis is just incredibly exciting. We're so thrilled to know that this is offered upon the stock market. So um, I want to um, tell everyone how they can learn, please, about your company, what's your website, and Tim, please repeat your tickers one more time for everyone. Sure thing, yeah. So if anyone wants to find out more about us, uh, please look for us at www.entheonbiomedical.com. That's E-N-T-H-E-O-N biomedical.com. Um, follow our socials, but also please sign up for our newsletter. Um, you know, we think we have some very interesting um, and you know, promising announcements to be making. So uh, we would love for everyone to be in that stream of information so that, uh, uh, yeah, you can be sort of primed to receive more information as it comes. Um, and we are trading on the CSE under the ticker ENBI. Also, you can find us on OTC markets uh, under the ticker ENTBF, um, as well as on the Frankfurt Exchange under 1XU1, I believe. But all that information will be uh, for certain available on our website, which is, again, entheonbiomedical.com. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Thank you so much. Mr. Timothy Coe, CEO of Entheon Biomedical. For the CEO's Open Discussions Corner, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 